Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. How many of us can put our hands on our hearts and say we've never blown our top, cast caution aside and let rip in that most exquisite spasm of apoplexy, temper? Oh, we've all heard about road rage, trolley rage, you name it rage. That burning frustration, threatening to explode as you wait for the shopkeeper to finish her conversation before she serves you. But despite living in a culture that positively encourages us to let it all hang out, a few of us still don't like to admit that we lose our temper. But we've all been there. Certainly as children, the stamping feet, the clenched fists, wails of fury. But as adults, well, that's a different story. Have you ever caught sight of yourself in the mirror while in the throes of a rage? The bright red face, the huffing and puffing. When we've calmed down, we realise it's an ever so slightly undignified episode, which most of us would like to forget and quite often do. Not that that stops us falling into the trap again. How many of us can put our hands on our hearts and say we've never blown our top, cast caution aside and let rip in that most exquisite spasm of apoplexy, temper? Oh, we've all heard about road rage, trolley rage, you name it rage. That burning frustration, threatening to explode as you wait for the shopkeeper to finish her conversation before she serves you. But despite living in a culture that positively encourages us to let it all hang out, a few of us still don't like to admit that we lose our temper. But we've all been there. Certainly as children, the stamping feet, the clenched fists, wails of fury. But as adults, well, that's a different story. Have you ever caught sight of yourself in the mirror while in the throes of a rage? The bright red face, the huffing and puffing. When we've calmed down, we realise it's an ever so slightly undignified episode, which most of us would like to forget and quite often do. Not that that stops us falling into the trap again. Extract 2 Michael, do you think autobiography is a less honest form than biography? I think it's more personal but less comprehensive. It's probably better at getting at certain aspects of the truth, childhood, relationship with parents... And... But the problem arises, Michael, when people have an image they wish to protect. Politicians, for example, rock stars and sports performers. Well, my view is, wherever facts are in dispute, trust the biography. Mm -hmm. I think public figures, their autobiographies, often give themselves away inadvertently, but are not to be relied on wholly. Now, you've had the experience of helping a rock star, Frank Silver, write his autobiography. What was that like? Well, Frank has a streak of honesty, rare perhaps in his line of work. <laughs> it's almost a perverse masochistic wish to be straight in the face of his image, and that, in a sense, is his image. When we started, Frank told me to go to Scotland and check what he remembered with his relatives. Uh -huh. I said, we don't need that. The whole point about an autobiography is it's your view of what happened that people are interested in and it becomes a self-validating process. Michael, do you think autobiography is a less honest form than biography? I think it's more personal but less comprehensive. It's probably better at getting at certain aspects of the truth, childhood, relationship with parents... And... But the problem arises, Michael, when people have an image they wish to protect. Politicians, for example, rock stars and sports performers. Well, my view is, wherever facts are in dispute, trust the biography. Mm -hmm. I think public figures, their autobiographies, often give themselves away inadvertently, but are not to be relied on wholly. 
Now, you've had the experience of helping a rock star, Frank Silva, write his autobiography. What was that like? Well, Frank has a streak of honesty, rare perhaps in his line of work. <laughs> it's almost a perverse masochistic wish to be straight in the face of his image, and that, in a sense, is his image. When we started, Frank told me to go to Scotland and check what he remembered with his relatives. Uh -huh. I said, we don't need that. The whole point about an autobiography is it's your view of what happened that people are interested in and it becomes a self-validating process. Extract 3 What's likely to happen all over the world is that we'll see an increasing homogenization of the Earth's plant life. There's plenty of evidence to show that that's going on. I'm particularly worried about aliens, plants that have insinuated themselves into ecosystems where they don't belong. Many ecologists now believe that the spread of such aliens is the second biggest threat to the world's range of species after habitat loss. A lot of the species we're talking about that are currently causing this problem were deliberately brought in for ornamentation. But once aliens are established, it's not easy to get rid of them. They become a problem not because native ones are effete and ripe for takeover by more aggressive colonists, but because native plants have their own predators, insects, etc., fungal diseases. When you have an introduction into a country, it doesn't have anything that's adapted to live on it. And so the alien is able to grow very well with a release from that competition, I suppose. What's likely to happen all over the world is that we'll see an increasing homogenization of the Earth's plant life. There's plenty of evidence to show that that's going on. I'm particularly worried about aliens plants that have insinuated themselves into ecosystems where they don't belong. Many ecologists now believe that the spread of such aliens is the second biggest threat to the world's range of species after habitat loss. A lot of the species we're talking about that are currently causing this problem were deliberately brought in for ornamentation. But once aliens are established, it's not easy to get rid of them. They become a problem not because native ones are effete and ripe for takeover by more aggressive colonists, but because native plants have their own predators, insects, etc., fungal diseases. When you have an introduction into a country, it doesn't have anything that's adapted to live on it. And so the alien is able to grow very well with a release from that competition, I suppose. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a man called Derek Lane giving a talk on the subject of ancient trees. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. Good evening. My name's Derek Lane, and I've come to talk to you this evening on the topic of ancient trees. I've always been fascinated by such trees, given their cultural and historical significance. In the past, ancient trees were often credited with having healing powers and featured heavily in many aspects of folklore, because anything that lives for thousands of years is bound to impress, providing, as they do, a direct link with our ancestors, with our history. 
Ancient trees often served as the location for important religious ceremonies, as well as all kinds of social gatherings, with important local buildings being built nearby as testimony to their significance to the community. These days we are less impressed by such notions, but nonetheless we're becoming more aware of our ancient trees, some of which may turn out to be even older than we had imagined. For example, of those discovered so far, the creosote bush found in California is thought to live for up to 11,000 years. The creosote bush gets its name due to its peculiar smell. It's like the tar that's used on telegraph poles to preserve the wood. It's a robust bush which grows abundantly. A research project was recently set up to discover just how many species there were worldwide which could live for over a thousand years, and at the last count had notched up 70 in all kinds of unexpected places. For example, the researchers had originally been erroneously advised to ignore places defined as tropical rainforest because life cycles in that type of environment are so rapid that ancient trees were thought to be unlikely. This led researchers to look in even more unlikely places, many of which have proved to contain old, if not ancient, specimens. Some of this research took place in the Amazon basin in South America. The researchers used a technique called carbon dating to find out the age of various trees, and turned up trees 1,200, 1,400 years old on a regular basis. Counting the rings in a tree trunk is now thought to be an old-fashioned way of calculating a tree's age. However, new technological developments mean that this can reveal evidence about a region's climate more accurately than if human hands had kept such records. Yet another critical reason for locating and preserving ancient trees one reason for the persistence of certain old trees is that they develop hollow trunks. Far from indicating that the tree is at all unhealthy, a hollow trunk provides it with greater stability in the face of strong winds, so it's a natural process of self-preservation. Not all old trees survive completely unaided, of course. In Europe, one reason why so many trees have lasted so long is the system of woodland management known as coppicing. This technique, which involves cutting off the branches in a systematic way over a period of time, aims to provide a fuel source which isn't going to run out. But a useful side effect of the process is that it prolongs the life of the tree. Coppicing seems to regenerate the trees, and barring disease or fire, some individual trees will last for thousands of years if managed properly. Apart from marveling at their great antiquity, there are other reasons for naturalists to prize ancient trees. Each individual tree represents a unique habitat in its own right, for it provides a complex patchwork of different microhabitats for a range of small creatures. There are something like 1,700 different invertebrate species in Britain alone, which are dependent on the fact that the tree trunks are in a gradual state of decay. Every one of a tree's residents has its own favorite niche, and between them the various spiders, beetles, ants, and flies manage to exploit every nook and cranny available. Now you'll hear part two again. Good evening. My name's Derek Lane, and I've come to talk to you this evening on the topic of ancient trees. I've always been fascinated by such trees, given their cultural and historical significance. In the past, ancient trees were often credited with having healing powers, and featured heavily in many aspects of folklore, because anything that lives for thousands of years is bound to impress, providing, as they do, a direct link with our ancestors, with our history. Ancient trees often served as the location for important religious ceremonies, as well as all kinds of social gatherings, with important local buildings being built nearby as testimony to their significance to the community. These days we are less impressed by such notions, but nonetheless we're becoming more aware of our ancient trees, some of which may turn out to be even older than we had imagined. For example, of those discovered so far, the creosote bush found in California is thought to live for up to 11,000 years. The creosote bush gets its name due to its peculiar smell. 
It's like the tar that's used on telegraph poles to preserve the wood. It's a robust bush which grows abundantly. A research project was recently set up to discover just how many species there were worldwide which could live for over a thousand years, and at the last count had notched up seventy in all kinds of unexpected places. For example, the researchers had originally been erroneously advised to ignore places defined as tropical rainforest because life cycles in that type of environment are so rapid that ancient trees were thought to be unlikely. This led researchers to look in even more unlikely places, many of which have proved to contain old, if not ancient, specimens. Some of this research took place in the Amazon basin in South America. The researchers used a technique called carbon dating to find out the age of various trees and turned up trees 1,200, 1,400 years old on a regular basis. Counting the rings in a tree trunk is now thought to be an old-fashioned way of calculating a tree's age. However, new technological developments mean that this can reveal evidence about a region's climate more accurately than if human hands had kept such records. Yet another critical reason for locating and preserving ancient trees. One reason for the persistence of certain old trees is that they develop hollow trunks. Far from indicating that the tree is at all unhealthy, a hollow trunk provides it with greater stability in the face of strong winds, so it's a natural process of self-preservation. Not all old trees survive completely unaided, of course. In Europe, one reason why so many trees have lasted so long is the system of woodland management known as coppicing. This technique, which involves cutting off the branches in a systematic way over a period of time, aims to provide a fuel source which isn't going to run out. But a useful side effect of the process is that it prolongs the life of the tree. Coppicing seems to regenerate the trees, and barring disease or fire, some individual trees will last for thousands of years if managed properly. Apart from marveling at their great antiquity, there are other reasons for naturalists to prize ancient trees. Each individual tree represents a unique habitat in its own right, for it provides a complex patchwork of different microhabitats for a range of small creatures. There are something like 1,700 different invertebrate species in Britain alone, which are dependent on the fact that the tree trunks are in a gradual state of decay. Every one of a tree's residents has its own favorite niche, and between them the various spiders, beetles, ants, and flies manage to exploit every nook and cranny available. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear a radio discussion on the subject of dictionaries. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best, according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three. The creation of dictionaries used to be a slow and genteel process, but these days dictionaries seem to be subject to the same pressures as any other book. I'm joined by Dr Elaine Wilson, publishing manager for The New London Dictionary, and Tony Travis, who's a professional dictionary compiler, otherwise known as a lexicographer. 
Elaine, do you agree that competitive pressure is now there in dictionaries? I think it's true. Generally, there's an enormous market for dictionaries overseas now, for example. And I feel under a lot of pressure from management. We have to maximise the income that we make from dictionaries, and of course, the way to do that is to keep them as up to date as possible. And how are the decisions made? Um, there's a rigorous system for assessing whether a new word should go in the dictionary. We have a team of readers who go through material for us and provide us with examples, and this gives us a big database. We then look at any potential new entries, and what we're looking for is the frequency and breadth of use. So. We want to see that a word's being used by more than one journalist, commentator, writer, or speaker, and we're also looking for use in more than one level of media. Tony, people say anecdotally that the influence of America is very strong because of television programs, movies, the internet. Do we see that also in dictionaries? Oh, oh yes, yes. The American domination of the media still means that a lot of the new words come from the United States. But there is a fight back. There's a lot more Australian, Caribbean, Northern English coming into the language, mainly through slang. Elaine, we talked about the internet and new technology. It must make it easier to track a word. Oh yes, it does. Much of the data gathering that our various teams do in order to authenticate a new word or usage has been accelerated. It's also improved the compiling process, because all the stages are done electronically, and equipment will continue developing over the next decade or so. Does it worry you, Tony? This competitive pressure. Oh yes, and in fact, I must be clear about this. This is not a totally objective profession. I mean, it's very interesting if you look at these new dictionaries. There are very few technical terms relating to farming, climbing, and fishing, for example, but there are a huge number relating to alternative medicine, the theatre, and journalism. I think this says something about where the lexicographers are coming from. Very briefly, both of you,、uh, doctors have this mania for finding a new disease. Do you? Is it tempting to invent a word yourself to go into the dictionary, Tony? Ah,、uh, I've been told that most lexicographers slip in at least one invention. Just <laughs> do you have to watch your staff on this? <laughs> no, no, we never slip in our own invented words. That would go against everything we stand for. Anyway, we have our work cut out capturing all the genuine new words without trying to invent others. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we believe you, <laughs> Elaine Wilson and Tony Travis. Thank you. Now you'll hear part three again. The creation of dictionaries used to be a slow and genteel process, but these days dictionaries seem to be subject to the same pressures as any other book. I'm joined by Dr. Elaine Wilson, publishing manager for the New London Dictionary, and Tony Travis, who's a professional dictionary compiler, otherwise known as a lexicographer. Elaine, do you agree that competitive pressure is now there in dictionaries? I think it's true. Generally, there's an enormous market for dictionaries overseas now, for example, and I feel under a lot of pressure from management. We have to maximise the income that we make from dictionaries, and of course, the way to do that is to keep them as up to date as possible. And how are the decisions made? Um, there's a rigorous system for assessing whether a new word should go in the dictionary. We have a team of readers who go through material for us and provide us with examples, and this gives us a big database. We then look at any potential new entries, and what we're looking for is the frequency and breadth of use. So, we want to see that a word's being used by more than one journalist, commentator, writer, or speaker, and we're also looking for use in more than one level of media. Tony, people say anecdotally that the influence of America is very strong because of television programs, movies, the internet. Do we see that also in dictionaries? Oh, oh yes, yes. The American domination of the media still means that a lot of the new words come from the United States. But there is a fight back. There's a lot more Australian, Caribbean, Northern English coming into the language, mainly through slang. Elaine, we talked about the internet and new technology. It must make it easier to track a word. Oh yes, it does. Much of the data gathering that our various teams do in order to authenticate a new word or usage has been accelerated. It's also improved the compiling process, because all the stages are done electronically, and equipment will continue developing over the next decade or so. 
Does it worry you, Tony, this competitive pressure? Oh, yes. And, in fact, I must be clear about this. This is not a totally objective profession. I mean, it's very interesting if you look at these new dictionaries. There are very few technical terms relating to farming, climbing and fishing, for example. But there are a huge number relating to alternative medicine, the theatre and journalism. I think this says something about where the lexicographers are coming from. Very briefly, both of you, uh, doctors have this mania for finding a new disease. Do you... Is it tempting to invent a word yourself to go into the dictionary? Tony? Uh, I've been told that most lexicographers slip in at least one invention just to... <laughs> Do you have to watch your staff on this? <laughs> No. No, we never slip in our own invented words. That would go against everything we stand for. Anyway, we have our work cut out capturing all the genuine new words without trying to invent others. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we believe you. <laughs> Elaine Wilson and Tony Travis, thank you. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about a work of art. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what first brought the work of art to the speaker's attention. Now look at task two. For questions 26 to 30, Choose from the list, A to H, what each speaker appreciates most about the work of art. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker 1 I'd never really been into ceramics, but during a wet family holiday, I was talked into visiting an art pottery studio. I thought we'd just be viewing stuff, but the potter was there, large as life, and that's how I came to see this vase emerge out of a piece of clay. Impressed by her skill, I ordered one on an impulse, just as a souvenir, really, not as an investment or anything. Though, looking at reviews on the net, she's obviously quite highly thought of. People ask what I see in it, and I agree it doesn't really stand up to close inspection, but it's kind of striking in a way that I find aesthetically pleasing. I never tire of it. Speaker 2 It's a painting. Rather an abstract one at that. I'd never have known it existed if I hadn't bumped into a friend one day at the local gallery. It was tucked down a back corridor. I found out later that the critics had really slammed it, so it was on sale at a giveaway price. And I admit it's quite puzzling, really. Spooky, almost. Yet I could spend hours just looking at it, wondering what the artist was trying to say. Anyway, this friend hated it and wanted to tell me why. We'd been on an art appreciation course together once, so I'll never forget the look on his face when I told him I'd been back and bought it. Speaker 3 I was fortunate enough to get the drawing as a wedding present. I love it to bits because it's so brilliantly executed. I knew of its existence, of course, because my mother sat for the artist and had often talked about the experience, though not about specific works. I remember her talking about the thrill of watching him draw. I came across a critical appraisal of his work online, which listed the main pieces, and one was called simply Emma, my mother's name. 
Quite how my friend managed to get hold of it is a mystery to me, but it was a wonderful surprise. I really don't like to think about how much it might be worth. Speaker 4 People think it's a photo, but it's actually a computer-enhanced painting. It's one of those pictures where the longer you look, the more you see. But it's not so much the detail that draws me to it, though it must have taken ages to do. It's more the way it takes me back to my childhood. It just brings it all back. And to think, if I'd never signed up for that evening class in software design, I'd never have met Alice, whose work it actually is. When I said how much I liked it, she wanted to give it to me as a present, but I said no way and made her accept a fair price. Speaker 5 The thing about silver from India is that it's very finely decorated with an intricacy that I find irresistible. People in Europe admire the craftsmanship, but I can see from their reactions that they aren't really in tune with the aesthetics of the objects, which is a shame. But at least it means the stuff is less collectible here, which stops prices getting out of hand. The elephant's my personal favourite, because it was presented to me at my graduation party. An antique dealer friend advised my parents where to look for pieces in their price range. But, of course, they needed no help in choosing the one that I'd fall in love with. Now play the recording again. Speaker 1 I'd never really been into ceramics, but during a wet family holiday, I was talked into visiting an art pottery studio. I thought we'd just be viewing stuff, but the potter was there, large as life, and that's how I came to see this vase emerge out of a piece of clay. Impressed by her skill, I ordered one on an impulse, just as a souvenir, really, not as an investment or anything. Though, looking at reviews on the net, she's obviously quite highly thought of. People ask what I see in it, and I agree it doesn't really stand up to close inspection, but it's kind of striking in a way that I find aesthetically pleasing. I never tire of it. Speaker 2 It's a painting, rather an abstract one at that. I'd never have known it existed if I hadn't bumped into a friend one day at the local gallery. It was tucked down a back corridor. I found out later that the critics had really slammed it, so it was on sale at a giveaway price. And I admit it's quite puzzling, really. Spooky, almost. Yet I could spend hours just looking at it, wondering what the artist was trying to say. Anyway, this friend hated it and wanted to tell me why. We'd been on an art appreciation course together once, so I'll never forget the look on his face when I told him I'd been back and bought it. Speaker 3 I was fortunate enough to get the drawing as a wedding present. I love it to bits because it's so brilliantly executed. I knew of its existence, of course, because my mother sat for the artist and had often talked about the experience, though not about specific works. I remember her talking about the thrill of watching him draw. I came across a critical appraisal of his work online, which listed the main pieces, and one was called simply Emma, my mother's name. Quite how my friend managed to get hold of it is a mystery to me, but it was a wonderful surprise. I really don't like to think about how much it might be worth. Speaker 4 People think it's a photo, but it's actually a computer-enhanced painting. It's one of those pictures where the longer you look, the more you see. But it's not so much the detail that draws me to it, though it must have taken ages to do. It's more the way it takes me back to my childhood. It just brings it all back. And to think, if I'd never signed up for that evening class in software design, I'd never have met Alice, whose work it actually is. When I said how much I liked it, she wanted to give it to me as a present, but I said no way and made her accept a fair price. Speaker 5 The thing about silver from India is that it's very finely decorated with an intricacy that I find irresistible. People in Europe admire the craftsmanship, 
but I can see from their reactions that they aren't really in tune with the aesthetics of the objects, which is a shame. But at least it means the stuff is less collectible here, which stops prices getting out of hand. The elephant's my personal favourite, because it was presented to me at my graduation party. An antique dealer friend advised my parents where to look for pieces in their price range, but of course they needed no help in choosing the one that I'd fall in love with. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. <laughs>